this is where I work every day, or I try to work every day, because it's an ongoing conversation that you have with yourself and with art history and with art, uh, your fellow artists. And these are the things I'm working on right now. And it really about, um, about language. I realized that um, ever since I got the Parkinson's thing, diagnosis, I, uh, it's somehow, for some reason, the, the idea of language and the coefficient of caricature in a painting has become really important. And I think it's the idea that when you solve a problem, when you solve a puzzle, your, uh, your brain gives you a little shot of dopamine and it's kind of a reward and it's something that we inherently own as as human beings it's something that keeps us uh cartwheeling forward and solving problems and getting you know being curious about the world that we live in and for some reason it's become really important so all my work has become about shapes that turn into something else and i've been working with horses and horsemen a great deal mostly because of the mobility aspect and also when a man gets up on a horse, your, uh, your vision and your idea of time and distance and history changes. So you're no longer on the ground level uh, with a diminished view. So it's something that adds your, to your view. And among other things, it's, it's just, to me, it's a really compelling thing. And I also love horses. And this is, uh, this is something I'm working on. It's, it's something I wanted to keep it, I want it to be coarse. I want it to be uh, rough and open and not kind of delicate and kind of refined. I've done things that are really delicate and refined and for some reason I need this idea of this like rough application of paint and rough uh, surfaces and that are just, that are, they're just, they jump out at you. And um, the, the idea is to get all these things to jump and then consider whether you want them to be orchestrated, an orchestrated movement, or do you want it to be chaotic? And there's something to be said about chaos, and there's something to be said about orchestrated movement. But I think uh, the end result, what I think I'm going to go for is something that's got a little of both, and something that's got reconciled areas that are logical uh, language as far as color, paint, and uh, shapes. And other areas that are completely um, unreconciled, unresolved, and just to see what happens in a painting. What I want is not to have this immediate recognition of what the thing is, but what it's doing, what the colors and the shapes are doing. And perhaps in the best paintings that I, that I think that I see nowadays, which is different than what it used to be, I'm left in a state of like un unknowing of like of uh, sort of a, a middle state where I'm not sure where, where I should be thinking about the painting, but it's something that leaves you and it's kind of like, you, it leaves your brain and it's open, it sort of opens up your, your thoughts in a, in a greater, greater venue. So that's, um, I would love to be able to work in that direction, but I think I think I was too, when I learned how to paint, or maybe it's my character, but I, I was just too realistic in my, in my output. I've really never painted a, an abstract painting, which I, I think I'm, I'm working towards, but I just, I always recognize something in the painting and I had to really, I'm sort of tempted to go in that direction to bring out that, that thing that I see. And I think that's also valid, so. But this, is, this painting is, um, is it's getting there. It's I probably repaint the whole thing, but there are certain aspects of it that I like and that I want to keep. So each painting teaches me something. Each painting has a lesson. The thing is to keep it to make something that's unified, and it's not just one little corner or one little area that works. And that's the challenge. That's the thing that gets you up in the morning. That makes me come here as soon as I can, and stay here as long as I can. And it, it engages me because I come here at three o'clock in the afternoon and then I stay here till nine o'clock or 10 o'clock and I, the time just goes by like I'm not completely unaware of time. I'm just one thought to the next, to the next, to the next. And I completely lose the reference of what's going on outside. And that's, that in itself is a, is a gift. It's, I know that's the highest 
it's the highest calling for a man or, or mankind to be able to, to go somewhere and be able to be free to do that, to consider ideas and to just to layer one thing upon the other. And, um, and it's just, a, it's such a, an amazing gift that I have. Not that I, that I the painting, it's just the, the ability to paint, but it's also, it's the, the wherewithal to be able to paint in this way, in this kind of like irresponsible way in a sense where I'm not, I'm not really sort of joined at the hip with any kind of product that I create. Each one of my paintings is a little different, I think, and that's, that to me is a positive. So um, if I really wanted to be a commercially successful artist, I would find um, one, one venue or one kind of form to work on and then just repeat it over and over again. But I think I'm at a stage where I'm learning so much from each painting and I'm getting such a thrill from this, these little discoveries. It's like, look, look at this. These colors are completely incongruent to what everything else that was in there. And I put those on last night uh, after I came back, I had dinner and I came back and I just mixed these colors and I put them on. And it jabs up the whole painting, they energize the whole surface. But I wouldn't have thought of it as a, as a possibility because they really have nothing to do with any of the other colors in, in character or in function, but um, they, they, in my mind, they work right now. And I think, I think, I don't know, I think um, I learned so much about the form and about the, um, about the proper way to make a painting, about what a painting should properly do, the kind of function it, it should perform. But I'm starting to think that it's got a bigger calling, painting it's, itself has a bigger calling. And our minds are, are 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 really hungry for things that are not that are always resolved, and something that is um, that has these in, in, inner innate kind of quirks to them that doesn't make it want to work. It's like these wonderful Rubik's, uh, these wonderful machines that look like they could work, but then there's some flaw in them that that, that doesn't allow them to work. And when that happens, the the viewer or the person that's experiencing that machine um has to has to really leap and has to really think and has to project and i think that's where the big thoughts and that's where the where the positive aspect of painting come in is they, they create this kind of uplifting um situation it's this location geographical location where you go and you sort of get lost in your thoughts and your brain does what it's supposed to do which is to resolve riddles and resolve problems and figure out patterns and figure out intent or narratives. And that's what we're good at. And I think the less that you resolve something, I'm, I'm starting to think that the less you resolve something, um, the more power the painting has and the more value it has. Because it does allow the viewer to, uh, to, to jump, to leap, to, to work, to do something in response to the painting, instead of just being fed everything the the rationale if uh if the, the coefficient of caricature and throughout the whole painting was was uh, equal and um and e efficient it would you would have a machine that works and then pretty soon you get tired of that machine and the machine would just go rattling off on its own and you you would lose its it would lose its value to you you know so that's my my thinking and i think it's got to do with I don't know, I've been thinking a lot. I mean, I, I had my brother killed himself and um, it's a sad thing, but it's, I mean, it's it, it was something that was, uh, and one one thought is that I um, I think that he he did the, the brave thing and he, he did the, the honorable thing, I think, because he really was not functioning well and he was really, he was hurting himself and he was hurting other people. And um, not that I think it was a good thing that he that he did this, but I can understand his his thinking, because he was always devoted to family and to others. He was always uh, he was always good that way. But what I meant, to, what I mean about my brother is that it's just that just the thought that he would he believed in all these thoughts that he was having, and he, they were so so palpable and they were so real to him 
that he actually felt the pain. I mean, this incredible pain for what these thoughts would engender if they were actually, if something actually was real that that he was thinking about. And um, and it just. In one way, it, it makes me realize how powerful art is, how about powerful writing is, how powerful uh, media is. Because when we experience a painting, when we experience a story, depending on your, in your nature, I think some people really get into the story and they really, and, and really um, empathize with the characters. And they really feel all these, these incredible feelings. So, um, in in his in his case, he couldn't help the feelings that he was having, but it was really fiction. He was reacting to fiction, and it makes me it just it really started to me me to think about the things that we we experience, the real things that we experience, and how they relate to the to the fiction that we experience, to the uh, to the movies, to the to the shows, to the to the books that we read. And how separate are those things, or are they separate at all? And do they leech one into the other? Do they? Uh, do we walk around, kind of, when we're not really consciously aware of what our thoughts, where our thoughts are going? Are we mixing up uh, real experiences with with uh, conceptual things, with with fiction that we experience every day? And it just makes me wonder about our existence and about our. Our perception of, of consciousness, our consciousness, how we, who are we? I mean, it's just so hard to tell who we are because of this, because we're, we're it's just not this finite, you know, uh, being that, um, that is, you can say, well, they are this because they have had this experience, but they've also, and they've also consumed a world of, a world of uh, mythology and a world of history that is sort of um, in, in this kind of precarious balance with reality. So when when I, I used to talk to Rich, my brother, he would say things that I realized that he was truly thinking, truly believed, he was honest and he was earnest in his belief that these things were going on and they were not good things. But I was just astounded by how they leached into every day, his everyday life. And so, but he had um, he had a, there was an, some kind of a chemical imbalance in his brain. And, um, but his, meant his imbalance was absolute, but we all walk around with, we on the mean and off the mean, you know, where some of us are, are more, are more normal than others in a sense of more well balanced than others. Some have a little bit of that imbalance. And with a little bit of that imbalance, maybe that makes you a highly creative person that you can engender and you can uh, you can uh, think about things that other people wouldn't quite think about because you can actually encompass them, you can feel them. So um, so it's you know it's it's an amazing thing that happens you know it's a, it's this, the idea of creativity and our our disability and this incredibly humane. Um, I, I, ability that we have to to visualize things that are not there and to visualize and project things that that might be a positive that might be positively you know uh, affect humanity which is what keeps us going and it's like it's the devil and and and, and the, the angels and one on either shoulder we have these abilities to envision these great projects and great ideas and great things that are, are positive to human humankind. But then again, we can also fall back in these kind of petty, kind of like horrible sort of holes that we dig for ourselves in, in thinking the worst. And uh, so it's, you know, it's all, it's, it's what keeps us alive. And it's, it's like, I think I've always been an idea driven person. I never, I always had a hard time just chit chatting and like, uh, talking about baseball games or football games or whatever, but it's what keeps me interested. It's something for some reason, it's always been this, um, this thing that's always, it's a big question mark in my mind. It's like I once was on, it was on Madison Avenue and it was March day and it was a thaw, there had been a heavy snow and it was a, a warm day. And I remember the water was running really thick in the, in the gutters 
and I was waiting to uh, for the light to change so I could pass. And I hear this conversation, somebody, a woman having a conversation with some another woman and another woman responding. So there were three people conversing and then I looked up and I realized there was one person having this conversation with two other people who were all and who were all uh, imaginary. And the first thought I had was, there by the, the grace of God go I. If I didn't have some outlet, if I didn't have this kind of this uh, kind of structure of, of writing or painting, where would my brain, you know, wander to? You know, where where would it go? And I think that's one of the beautiful things about painting. And I'm not saying I'm susceptible to madness or anything. It's just I'm the, the most normal person in the world. But I just uh, I just have this creative aspect to myself that I think in my family runs thick, and especially in my mother's side. And I saw my mother go down the same road that my bro my brother went because she was a writer, she was a painter, and she was not being able to write and paint. And she was at a period in her life where it was just very, very sad. But anyway, I don't want to get into this sad stuff, but um, um, it's stuff that keeps you going. It's, it's ideas that keep you moving, moving forward. And because there's no, there's, there's always a hope that you can resolve a, a question that you have. And that's what keeps you going, you know, so. I'm going to fight as much as I can against this um, against this uh, Parkinson's, which sucks. But um, but I think um, for the time being, I can I can control it and I can paint and I can make it work, and I can um, sort of uh, make it uh, be something I can learn from, you know. So, but anyway, so this painting is it's on in the middle in the middle uh, stage. And hopefully it'll go somewhere. Maybe not. Maybe I'll just paint over it. But um, don't do that. I love it. Yeah, I think it's. I like it because it's coarse and it's kind of open. Yeah. You know, it's sort of based on this painting, which and it's one of the figures from that painting. I wanted to get one of those figures. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's all right, huh? Thank you for listening. But this is, I mean, this is my studio. It's like my temple. I mean, I, I, 20 years ago, I was in graduate school and I wrote this thing that was based on Borges on, um, on a story that he wrote, The Circular Ruins, mm -hmm. about a man who went, who found a, went up this river in the, in the Amazon and he found a ruin off the river and he went there and he meditated and his purpose was to dream up of another, dream up another man. And he was convinced that if he could think of every detail of this person, uh, from the physical aspects of it to their background, to their history, to the gene to genealogy, to their to their background, he could he could create another human being. And he went there and he and he it was this place where he felt 